Wow. Hey, we're going to read real quick from this book right here. From Reader's Digest, Mysteries of the Ancient Americas. Again, Mysteries of the Ancient Americas, a new world before so-called Columbus. And these are the people involved here, a lot of people involved in the research. There's some Olmec figurines we saw in the last video, future video. I want to read this chapter. This is page 144 of this book. It says here, the magnificent Maya. Who were the people that built towering temples and dizzy and stepped pyramids in the jungles of Mesoamerica? Savages never reared these structures. Savages never carved these stones, concluded the 19th century traveler, John L. Stevens. And we have his primary source uh, first-hand account book we're going to get into as well. We have read it before. When Europeans first landed on the shores of Mexico, Yucatan Peninsula, early in the 16th century, the great Maya centers were already faded relics. Okay? Time-worn, overgrown, and abandoned by the time the Europeans got here. And yet they still possessed a haunting beauty, enveloping all who came near in a flood of amazement. For there, deep within the dense tropical forest or clustered on the barren limestone tip of the peninsula, rose not one or two monuments or even one or two settlements, but a vast architectural complexes studded with palaces and pyramids, each structure and each setting a triumph of grace and power. That's what they found over here. Palaces and pyramids, not just one little town here and there. The awe-inspiring remains of the 60 or so Maya cities were simply the most visible and enduring evidence of a civilization spectacular in its learning and achievement. In addition to being master engineers and architects, the Maya were sophisticated mathematicians, accomplished astronomers, and meticulous historians who refined a complex hieroglyphic system of writing for recording their past. In their art and architecture, they achieved a style that is intricate and as technically dazzling as it is visually impressive. The true dimensions of Maya civilization, however, were lost upon most Spaniards, who in their haste to conquer and convert failed to comprehend what lay before them. Not until the 19th century that extent and grandeur of Maya culture began to be fully explored and publicized, awakening a quickly captivated world to the fact that high civilization, okay, high civilization on the order of ancient Egypt 
just like ancient Egypt had flourished, the real Egypt, right? The real Tamari had flourished for nearly 1,000 years in the new world and most likely possibly longer than that, right? Continue a little further in the book, it says, since surviving examples of sculpture, both three-dimensional and more commonly bas relief, vastly outnumbered Maya painting, the paintings that do survive are especially valued. Until 1946, this is when they found this place. I'm just, we're going to talk about it right now. All right? Until 1946, they just found it, right? That was recent. There was little reason to assume that any finer examples of Maya murals had survived than those at Palenque and Tulum. Then in one of those accidental discoveries, which and live in history, all right? An accidental discovery, so-called, right? A documentary filmmaker seeking to record the life of the primitive Lacandon Maya, perhaps descendants of classic forebears, was led to the abandoned site later called Bonampak, which was at one time probably a center associated with the larger center of Jakshilan, roughly 100 miles southwest of Tikal in the Petén. There he found a modest one-story building with three entrances leading to three separate chambers with corbelled vaulted ceilings. Entering one of these, the photographer found himself surrounded by a series of murals that covered the walls of the room from the floors to the capstones of the ceilings. He continued into the other two rooms, finding more scenes, all painted in realistic style and glowing richly in dim light. This incomparable treasure had never before been seen by non-Maya eyes. All right, I'm just going to look at a, an example of what they're talking about right here, all right? Bonampak murals, okay? As you can see, copper-colored tribes of America. All right, check this out. Over here, everywhere. You see? All right, copper-colored tribes of America. See how they're dressed? This is in Bonampak murals. Of considerable interest is the method by which the 9th century stucco paintings were produced. It was once thought that the murals were the work of several artists and assistants working as a team in the manner of European mural painters a few centuries later, and that they were swiftly painted while the plaster was still wet. We know now, however, that in this humid climate, the plaster remains damp for at least several days, thus giving the artist more time to complete the work. There is ample evidence at Bonham Park that the murals produced at this small site were, far from being anomalies, simply the grandest surviving examples of distinguished outpost. A new image for the Maya. The murals of Bonham Park have since been carefully copied, and in the modern mind their images have blended so fully with more stylized examples of Maya art that they are no longer startling in their realism. And yet they transformed our image of Maya art and our knowledge of Maya life, for they cover a range of human activities not often seen in other Maya art. Life as it was lived, albeit by the elite, late in the 8th century, unlike other murals that typically show gods, cosmology, and ritualism, those at Bonham Pub glorify actual events that took place there that's a big one big drop right there if you didn't understand what they just said it's not like in ancient egypt where they're just drawing mythology in the walls right Thoth and all their gods and all this mythology and bonham park they're actually drawing actual events that took place actual people actual events that really happened not stories or mythology the hieroglyphic texts that appear on the panels have now been completely deciphered, and they tell us that the series commemorates the exploits of an 8th century Bonham Park dynasty. The scenes in the first room show a young man taking part in a ceremony which scholars believe to be his investiture as the dynastic heir. On the same panel, a gala festival was taking place, perhaps in his honor, the musicians and dancers who march across the panel Trumpets blaring, rattles raised high, have an unmistakably celebratory look. Their white headdresses and necklaces, their patterned hip wrappings, 
and their brilliant masks and feathered instruments all evidence that they are participants in a ceremony of importance and glory. On the walls of the second room, a fierce battle is in progress which scholars date to August 2nd, AD 792, a time in the Maya calendar that was deemed propitious for warfare. The swarthy warriors, the what? Again, the swarthy warriors are dressed in spotted jaguar skins or brilliant robes of red or yellow. Swarthy, so, so swarthy, so-called black. The Negro warriors, right? The black warriors, right? Swarthy, the swarthy, swarthy warriors are dressed in spotted jaguar skins or brilliant robes of red or yellow. The figures often set against backgrounds of bright blue are as vivid and lively as ancient Egyptian tomb paintings, which they closely resemble in style. Oh, who's copying who? Where's the real ancient Egypt? They just told us these are actual events, real people, not mythology. Though time has erased much of the writing on the walls of the third room, enough remains to identify the great lord as Chan Muan, Chan or Khan Muan, roughly translated as Sky Owl, presiding over captives who are sacrificial victims. Horror registers on the face of a captive who kneels before his tormentors as if beseeching mercy, while below him lies the exhausted body of another prisoner, and a third regard his mutilated hand which is dripping blood. With Chan Muan are two of his wives, one of whom, Lady Rabbit, the writing tells us, is descended from Chachilan dynasty. To judge from the Bonapak murals and other works of art, the Maya loved ornamentation and personal adornment, and the elite, at least, were fully able to indulge their taste. Their outer garments were frequently so overlaid with feathers shells and colorful beads that it is impossible to tell the underlying material from which they were fashioned. But a few scattered fragments of surviving textiles and the evidence left by art suggest that, for the most part, the Maya wore cotton clothing and some animal hides. Okay, so first of all, let me go up to this image. Again, remember what they just said, swarthy warriors, right? All right, so look at this with the feathered hairdress. All right, what's just coming out of here? Is that his hair way back here? All right, swarthy warrior, swarthy, so swarthy. All right, you see the ornament, the clothing. This is on the wall. This is how they painted themselves, all right, in Bonham Park. This is in Mexico, okay? This is how they painted themselves. We would know even less were it not for the discovery of this unimposing looking building, which in 1946 was publicized to the world by a filmmaker named Giles G. Healy. For here is the fabled Bonham Park, a name which means in Maya, painted walls. The building contains three rooms, each of which is covered, walls and ceiling, with a virtual encyclopedia of scenes at a Maya court. These murals have enabled scholars to reconstruct much more completely the details of ritual, costume, social custom, and life as it was lived in such centers as Tikal, Copan, and Palenque during the 4th to 9th centuries AD. The pigments have been amazingly preserved by mineral deposits on the plaster, enabling us to make accurate renderings. To see, for example, that though the Maya were not a notably warlike people, they did carry out military raids and took prisoners, perhaps for religious sacrifice. All right, so now I want to bring you to this book. A lot of you know this book, especially a lot of the people who were into the whole Pan-African culture. You know, we all were, you know, before we knew all this stuff. And uh, this was one of the books and uh, one of the authors. This book is called Before Columbus, links between the old world and ancient America, all right? Because always they're trying to, you know, start everything out on that side of the world, Mesopotamia, Africa. So everybody has to be coming in from that side of the world. So they see links from the old world because they find so much technology here, so many similarities with people and cultures of the old world, languages, script, you know, all that stuff, mythology. So they conclude it has to be from people that came, but 
this was original. A lot of this stuff was original to America. And it's by Cyrus H. Gordon. Again, a lot of you know this uh, person. So let's touch the hijack before we, you know, read this book. Remember, we're in the mind of a hijack, a Pan-African one, <laughs> especially Mr. Cyrus H. Gordon. I'm in chapter uh, one of this book, and it says here, Mesoamericans portrayed by their own sculptors. I mean, and this is how they portrayed themselves. One would expect that the people portrayed were Indians, right, in quotations. But what is an Indian? All right, so again, when people, uh, you know, especially in this time, are thinking Indians, it's the Indian they show in those TV commercials with the tear coming down, the Italian actor, you know, like a whole different look or a specific uh, look that they want us to imagine, right, when they say Indian. The only definition that makes sense is an American Indian is any member of the various groups of people inhabiting North and South America when Columbus reached the Western Hemisphere in 1492. In Middle America, there are many full-blooded Indian communities in various regions such as the Aztec and Maya areas. The remarkable fact of the countless Mesoamerican ceramic figurines is that they portray few, if any, American Indian types, such as the Aztec or Maya before AD 300. All right, so what do they mean by that? They're saying they're looking different, different types. Those that appear prior to the date and many that appear for a thousand years thereafter belong to other races, such as Far Eastern, African Negro, and Caucasian, all right? And this is how they're breaking it down. So if anybody looks Asian, they call them Far Eastern. If anybody looks so-called Negro, they call them African Negro. And if anybody has anything that they would consider white people phenotypes, they will call Caucasian. But we don't, they can't determine that based on a clay figurine and you cannot tell me these people that have the so-called negro phenotype but from africa just because they have a so-called negro phenotype because so-called negro have been here since the beginning in america all right so that's what i'm saying we got to dodge the hijack but they're going to show some very interesting figurines for us for us to use our own eyes because we know what we're looking at we know about america is the true old world so we're going to break it down with our own vision Okay, it says, among the latter are a number of Mediterranean types, especially Semites. Especially what? Shemites. Mediterranean, oh, Hebrew looking, oh, Canaanite looking, oh, Ishmaelite looking, oh, I see, oh, Semites. The evidence for the preceding is on record in an important and handsomely illustrated book by Alexander von Wuttenau. All right, we got that book. The Art of Terracotta Pottery in Pre-Columbian Central and South America. From 1970, we shall review some of the ceramic sculptures to get an idea of their implications. Now, even though we've gone over that book from Alexander von Wooten, we're going to get Cyrus' uh, perspective on it. And he has some other images that are not in uh, von Wattenu's book. All right, he has some other images. We start with the large mystic Negro head from Oaxaca. It is post-classical. 18 centimeter sign belongs to the Josue Science Collection in Mexico. The black color and the features such as the thick lips leave no doubt in anyone's mind that the artist has portrayed a Negro. No doubt, a Negro, all right? And that all that, this is their only evidence for the calling, saying that these people came from Africa just because it portrays a Negro. No artist can invent authentic races of mankind such as the types we are examining the implication is simply that early america was the melting ground of various races of men from the old world no dash the hijack no they were here the, it, this is the melting ground you just said it this is ground zero this is the melting ground of various races of men who were eventually absorbed into the modern indian populations that's what they're saying the group of varied sculptured heads is of interest in different ways. The upper heads, and it says the measurements are early classical stylized Negro types from Veracruz with scar tattooing, which is practiced widely in Africa. All right. Tattooing is worldwide, not just an African thing. That's not proof. You see, I'm just letting you know this was what they were going off this whole time. When people migrate, they transport cultural traits from their old home 
to the new. Oh yeah, well we know that. So, what if we? What if Americans brought it over there and you're seeing it in reverse? It's all conjecture, right? I can say that too. Accordingly, the presence of African Negroes in early America implies some sort of cultural impact. All right, dodge the hijack. He's adding this. All right, Cyrus, Mr. Gordon, Pan African. That's why I was telling somebody. I don't never known him to be a Pan African. Well, he is a Pan African. He just added all this because he found Negroes with tattoos. So he said, "Oh, there's got to be Africans, right?" No, that's not an African thing. On the lower left is a late classical dancer wearing an ornate headdress. Here we are dealing with a type that is readily recognized as Indian. Earlier in the date is the old man to the right, about 15 centimeters high in the Tulane University collection, a Near Easterner who might be Semitic, but looks more like an aged Armenian. This plate illustrates the nature of the problem. In early classical times, the Mesoamerican scene was complex with Caucasians from Eurasia and Blacks from Africa, but also with the prevailing Indian types represented by the ancient artists. All right, so again, Dosh the Hijack, you see how he's breaking it down? He's putting all anybody that look, can look so-called Negro into Africa. These could be, you know, Black Celtic, Black Vikings, you never know. Or they could just be from America, right? It is important for us to be familiar with the true Indian types that first appear in any significant number around AD 300. Again, all this time we were just describing what we're about to see right here. It says here, post-classical mystic Negro head from Oaxaca, Mexico. This was the first one they were talking about. Let me just back up. I've shown this in color. I got this image in color. Okay. You can see. And I need some more right here. Uh, he was saying about the tattoos and stuff, so he's automatically saying these are Africans. That doesn't necessarily mean they're Africans. Tattooing was going on here in America, too. Original to America. All right? And then he got some other types here. He's calling whatever, Caucasian or Semitic or whatever he's calling, right? Mediterranean, I guess he was calling it. These are some other uh, sculptures here, as you can see. Very vivid details. All right, and you can see necklaces and the ornaments, the earrings, the big earrings, you can see that. There's classical characters, Indian types, classical tot Totonac dancers, it's torso, seated Negroid figure, classical period. If we are to speak of the non-Indian physiognomies that appear in ancient America on this plate, are two of the handsomest classical representations of Indians from Veracruz, such as those that can be seen today in Mexico. The girl, A, and the man, C, in spite of some stylization, for instance, and the treatment of the eyes are remarkably lifelike and expressive, and they rank among the finest pre-Columbian portraits. The nude torso of a classical Totona girl adorned with a fancy necklace is portrayed on the lower left as a sitting woman whose features appear more typical of a black Africa than of Indian America, all right? Of a black Africa, all right? Again, dodge the hijack from the Maya area of Ishimche in the province of Chimaltenango, Guatemala, comes a superb incense burner, probably of pre-classical date. It is 33.5 centimeters high and belongs to the Musée de Leon in Paris. Everything about the sculptured head, nose, beard, expression would fit a Northwest Semite or Shemite, a Northwest Shemite. Whether he was a Phoenician, Syrian, Israelite, Greek or even Etruscan is not important for delving into such problems often degenerates into unprofitable hyper finesse. All right. So I just want to point something out here because every time he might call an Israelite somebody that doesn't look African, so called black to him, you see, he's putting them in a different group. So that's why I say you got to dodge the hijack with this guy. All right. A lot of the Pan Africans don't even realize that. A lot of the Pan Africans who are Hebrew Israelites who like these kind of authors don't realize that he's not even including them as Israelites if they have the so-called African or West African or so-called black look or Negroid look. That's why I say we got to dodge the hijack with these uh, out-of-date researchers, right? Pan-Africans, really. 
If we be impelled to define him specifically, we may tentatively call him an ancient Mediterranean merchant prince from the early Iron Age into Roman times. People of his type maintain creative contact with Middle America. All right, so again, it's all conjecture what he's saying, but I get what he's saying. <laughs> but what if they were just coming from here? Rome, Rome where? North America, Rome, Rome, Georgia? What are you talking about? Rome, Washington, D.C.? Or what are you t talking about exactly? He typifies an important group of the merchant mariners who link the Mediterranean with the New World. The merchants, who's the merchants? Mariners, who had the ships, who had the trade routes, the port Jews, huh? who had it unlocked, you see, from ancient times. This is what I was trying to tell you in that series. His motives may have been trade, but trade for him meant the development as well as exchange of natural resources, all of which required the spread of science and technology. No physical anthropologist will try to change his classification from Mediterranean to American Indian. And the incense burners related to similar ones from Vera Cruz. Accordingly, in our merchant prints, we have a specific link between pre-classical Mesoamerica and the ancient Mediterranean, right? So listen to what he's saying. He's saying they found an incense burner and the guy looks like he's Mediterranean. So he says they found a link just because the guy has features where he would call Mediterranean. Again, America's a true old world. We had many different phenotypes. That's why I said Dosh the hijack time. But this is kind of like a image that he's talking about. And uh, they found this again in Mesoamerica, Maya. All right, bearded. And yeah, this is a phenotype they had. Why not? Why does it have to be from somewhere else? This is what I'm trying to explain to you about these scholars like Ivan Van Sertema and this guy, Mr. Gordon. It says here, Mayan head, uh, greater than life size and one want in a collection. All right, so they're saying, so these are not supposed to be in America, he's saying. It says here, and yet there was evidence that the total isolation of America could not be so. Ancient Japanese pottery found in Ecuador forced a repraisal, at least to the extent of trans-Pacific crossings. All right. He says they found ancient Japanese pottery in Ecuador. He's only saying it's Japanese because it looks Japanese. It hasn't been determined that it was actually coming from Japan. It could be original to Ecuador. All right. This is a future video. What is the connections? A lot of these ancient Asian nations, could a lot of them be coming from America? So an ancient Japanese pottery found in Ecuador forced a reappraisal, at least to the extent of trans-Pacific crossings. Moreover, physical anthropology shows that American Indian groups show a great deal of variation. In general, the farther they live from the Bering Strait, and thus the earlier they can be presumed to have left Asia. The less mongoloid they look, the less mongoloid they look. Some of them possess strikingly prominent noses, long heads or wavy hair, wavy hair, huh? In contrast to the flat noses, round heads and straight hair that the typical Mongolians have today. An early group of faces is aptly described by von Wotano as a collection of Semitic types. From left to right, they come from Guerrero, Veracruz, Tlatilco, the Maya area. The object is an incense burner, says Nayarit and Chiapas, a mask. All except the Nayarit figure are pre-classical. The beards and prominent noses point to Semitic rather than Indian subjects, are right, you see? So because they have beards, they say, no, they can't be from America. So that's why I say, you know, we know how to dodge the hijack. There is an interesting group of nine small heads from Guerrero, most of them are pre-classical, and the absence of Indian types among them is striking. They are remarkably varied among them is one that von Wutano identifies with the Ayanu, the hairy white aborigines of Japan. They weren't white. We know the Ayanu were dark-skinned people with coarse, coarse, woolly hair. The Ainu are now a dwindling minority, but they were more numerous and widespread in antiquity and may well have had a role in the migrations and diffusions of cultures across the Pacific. The testimony of ancient American sculpture is complex but clear to this extent. Long before the Vikings reached America, around AD 1000, Mesoamerica had long been the scene of the intermingling of different populations from across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, all right? They're finding all these different phenotypes, right? All these different evidences, all the mythology. We've already read a lot what they're finding here in America. So they have to conclude all these 
people from the old world that were coming over here, they never conclude that maybe these people were already here. But again, this is just more correlation to letting you know many different phenotypes in the old world of America, many different phenotypes. They're saying it's a scene of intermingling of different populations from across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Some of the most creative people in America came from the Near East, but no one group monopolized the scene, all right? They never monopolized, though. They never stuck around. The legends never stuck around. The history was lost, though, right? No, this is the America, the true old world. Continuing, it says, Caucasians from one end of Eurasia to the other came. Negroes from Africa, all right, Negroes from Africa, Mongolians of Chinese and Japanese side. So look at how they're just breaking down humanity into three types. And uh, they all came, but nobody was here, right? Nobody was living here. And these people came, right? From the Far East, from the Mediterranean, at different times came various Semites, including Phoenicians and Carthaginians, as well as Egyptians, Greeks, Etruscans, Romans, and still others, all right? All, everybody came, but nobody was here. All these people came, but they didn't stay. Nothing, their influence didn't stick around. Nothing, they didn't influence their history, they didn't write about it. It's not easily read. You don't think all these people would have wrote, yeah, we went to America and here it is. We went this year, we had trade. You think we wouldn't have found all this stuff? No, all these culture, all this stuff they're finding, they're just basing it off what these cultures look like. They're not, they don't have no evidence of ships coming over here, any written records. They don't have no sources. You understand where they're basing all this off? All right, so we got to dodge the hijack. It's frustrating reading this sometimes. But at least we see that they're definitely admitting that it's either it's either that old world people came or this is the old world, right? In general, the main consequence was the mingling of highly civilized people from all over the world, creating on American soil through the pooling of their cultural resources, a galaxy of brilliant Mesoamerican civilizations whose final phases are known to us as Inca, Maya, and Aztec. This is another thing. Could, you know, these civilizations been like a, you know, metropolis, like we have today of New York. We have different people all over the world going to New York. So could these Maya centers, Aztec, Inca, could they have allowed a lot of different cultures to come in and live in the city? I believe so. I believe so in that way, but not that they came and influence and that's why you see bears here. No, that was already here. Don't try to explain beard like that, that's silly. In culture, as in the physical universe, out of nothing comes nothing. The breathtaking achievements of the Mesoamericans could not be and were not the works of savages, okay, who lifted themselves up by their bootstraps. Instead, they are the culminations of mingled tr trends of civilization brought to these shores by a variety of talented people from Europe, Africa, and Asia, all right? Dodge the hijack big time, all right? Mr. Gordon, sorry, man. I disagree with you, man. Dodge the hijack. That's your own hijack, Mr. Gordon. So we couldn't have had civilization without all these other people coming to teach us, right? That's what he literally just said. But no, man. Who had corn? Who gave you guys corn? Who gave Europe, Africa, and Asia corn? Agriculture, building, caral supe, mummification, Chile, Peru, Chinchorro mummies, the animals, the food, all right? The food, who feeds the world? All the natural resources coming out of America, terrestrial paradise. No, Mr. Gordon, you are wrong about that, okay? This is one of the reasons I stayed away from this book and Ivan Van Sertimus, because they're so Pan-African with it, and they're so like biased with their, you know, oh, you know, they brought civilization, and if it wasn't for these people, they wouldn't have been great in America. No, we brought civilization to the world. Know that. All right, we'll continue on this one. Let's go through the uh, sculptures. Okay, look at that. So he's, they found this in America, right here in Central America, right? Look at this. All right. Statue from the Museo de Prehistoria Valencia featuring the, the nose reaching high on the forehead. All right, here's another image. Some more figurines. All right, so these could not be from people from America. No, right, because, you know, they don't look like Indians to him, he says. So early portrayals from left to right, Guerrero Veracruz, the Tlatilco Maya, incense burner, right? This is what they were saying. This is the Mediterranean link because they found an incense burner. 
some more over here if you guys can see look at that <laughs> all right the red heads mainly pre-classical all on indian of specific interest is B, which has been compared with the hairy Caucasian of Ainu of Japan. Hairy Caucasian, huh? B, where is B right here? So B, this is B right here. Yeah, that does look the, like the Ainu, the Swarthy Ainu. All right, look at that with the cheekbones, the dracons, like I was showing you guys before in the previous video. The hallmark of the classic period is polychrome pottery. This called the Chama vase shows not black skinned natives but Indians wearing black paint. So did you guys hear that? He said, these ain't black skinned Indians, this is black paint. Yeah, can you believe he said that? Dodge your own hijack right here, alright? Because they're trying to be subliminal here and they're lying right here they're trying to act like this is pain so everybody got black pain on right oh they also got hair wraps and dreadlocks right all right so let's hear that one more time in case you missed it all right let's hear them uh with the hijack the hallmark of the classic period is polychrome pottery this called the chama vase shows not black skinned natives but indians wearing black paint shows not black skinned natives but indians wearing black paint Shows not black skinned natives, but Indians wearing black paint. Mysteries of the Mexican Pyramids, again by Peter Tompkins. I just want to read this real quick too. All right, this is on page 153. It says the first real digs. All right, has these maps. You can see all this. I've shown this actual image before. All right, and just want to read the side note right here real quick. Let me zoom in. All right, I'm so then uh, it says Charnay was surprised at the variety of human types portrayed on masks, often with considerable artistic skill. There were the features of Caucasian, Greek, Chinese, Japanese, and Negro. All right, and Negro. This doesn't mean African. Also, Maya type heads with retreating foreheads, such as he had seen in Yucatan. They seem to validate the theories of Violet Leduc about an influx of Europeans and Asiatics, leading Charnay to comment that numerous races must have succeeded each other and amalgamated on the continent, which until lately was supposed to be so new and is in truth so old. This continent, America, is actually in truth so old, the true old world. Yes, this is the true old world. That's why you find all these phenotypes here. I've been trying to explain. We had all kinds of phenotypes. This is the origin. All right, this is Atlantis. All right. So it was supposed to be so new and is in truth so old. During 15 years of investigation of thousands of pre Columbian terracotta pottery heads and figures, art historian Alexander von Butenau found portraits of five different racial types Mongoloid, Chinese, Japanese, Negroid and all types of white people, especially Semitic. So Semitic supposed to be white. Dash the hijack, all right? Types with and without beers. So Semitic or Shem. The earliest Zapotec sculpture, thought to date from about 500 BC, shows Olmec influence. Traditionally called danzantes or dancers, these strangely rubbery, puffy mouth figures may represent corpses the bodies of enemies slain in battle. You could try to play it, but you're never gonna beat me. Look the other way, what I'm doing ain't easy. Bloody hands stain from the people who deceive me. Muddy hands break through the chains, go free me. Looking for change, looking for pain. Pulling a mob, pushing a train. I'll never stop, stick to a lane. Pick up the pieces and go rearrange. Uh. I'll be the best above all the rest, put me to the test and Expect nothing less, you check as I'm chess, what's happening next year? He got the venom, a tangible weapon, no coming in second, this life is a lesson He got a new engine from pain, that's a blessing, new focus, no guessing Just bold an obsession, all in his possession, you got the retention I'll leave an impression and take a redemption, just kill no discretion Your mind is a weapon, 11-11, it's time for progression, oh! You could try to play, but you're never gonna be me Look the other way, what I'm doing ain't easy Bloody and stain from the people who deceive me Muddy hands break through the chains, go free me 
people like sheep, who feed hurt it easy You don't wanna be fast asleep when they see me Better stand tall, ready for a fight, believe me When they try the chains, you can say no, free me so he's been looking for somebody who could save him Instead of searching inside for what they gave him A strong will, strong mind causes mayhem We could change the world, change times, rearrange them Staying on pace, running the race Life is a chase, I don't want a place I want to be first, work till it hurts Dehydrated thirst till I'm in a hearse oh. High ambitions in the right mind can take you so far It's, it's like, like you lived a few lifetimes Take off, so I'm a break off from the weak minds They can stay soft, you can change lives, you create thoughts Never waste time, you got one shot, you got one life Better pop off, what do you like? Make a dream job, no 9-5, no mean boss Just my life and free thoughts You could try to play, but you're never gonna beat me Look the other way, what I'm doing ain't easy Bloody and stain from the people who deceive me Muddy ends break through the chains, go free me People like sheep move feet, hurt it easy You don't wanna be fast asleep when they ski me Better stay tall, ready for a fight, believe me When they try the chains, you can say no, free me